Welcome to the Birth Lounge Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts to learn how to craft their ideal birth. You've got scary questions that you want to stop Googling, and we've got evidence-based answers with data to back it all up. Hey, y'all, and welcome back to another episode of the Birth Lounge Podcast. Today, I am interviewing my friend, Jen Campbell, who is the founder of VBAC Facts, and that's exactly what we're going to be diving into, VBAC Facts, all the things that you need to know about having a VBAC, what are the benefits, what are the risks, what are some questions you should be asking your provider, and what does the data say about vaginal birth after two cesareans? So, Jen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited. No one's more excited about this conversation than I am because so many times we have clients and inquiries of people who are honestly scared shitless of having a VBAC because there are very few providers out there who are well-skilled, who are well-educated, and who are themselves not terrified of vaginal birth after cesarean, for some reason, providers, many of them, not all of them, but many of them feel this fear that after the uterus has been cut into and fully recovered, that it still poses this extreme risk. And while obviously it does increase your risk for some things, it's very safe to have a VBAC for many, many people. And the success rate is really high for most folks. So Jen, before we like dive into the vaginal birth after two C-sections, let's start off with basic VBAC facts. Well, there are a few things to consider. You know, the thing that gets the most play, the most attention is that increased risk of uterine rupture. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of factors that impact what that risk is. But if someone is spontaneously laboring, so that means that they aren't given drugs for their labor to begin or drugs to help their labor progress, we see some of the lowest rates of uterine rupture among spontaneously laboring people. Uh, People who have one prior cesarean have the lowest uterine rupture rates. Um, We we think, and we'll be getting into this a little bit, you know, the research does show that the risks do increase after that second cesarean. Data is super limited on three or more cesareans, so we really can't say for sure what it does. But we know that the absolute risk, like you said, the odds of something of a uterine rupture occurring are still quite low. So that is important for people to hear. Um, And the other thing in terms of a successful VBAC is ensuring that you have a supportive provider. And like you said, there is a lot of fear and there is a lot of confusion. There's a lot of professional pressure. There's a lot of um, questions about why hospitals ban VBAC. I mean, and so when you see a hospital say, we aren't going to allow you to make this choice, a lot of people think, oh, well, that's because it must be super dangerous, right? But the reality is, if that's why we need to go and look at what the research says. And here in the US, what the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says. And when we do that, it's quite shocking to see the mismatch between what national guidelines and the evidence says versus what many people, including physicians and nurses, believe. Um, you know, the truth is VBAC is a safe, and reasonable option. It's completely mainstream. ACOG, again, the American College of OBGYNs suggests that people should have this option and they encourage people to have access to it. And people might say, okay, but if, why would ACOG do that? Well, one of the reasons is, is because we know from the research that it's safe, but we also know from the research that the risks increase with each prior cesarean. And those aren't just risks like uterine rupture. That's also risks like placenta accreta and placenta previa, which are placental abnormalities, the risk of hysterectomy, the risk of of excessive bleeding. And so these are complications that many people, especially things like accreta, are never informed about when they have that first cesarean, that second cesarean, that third cesarean. And so it's important for us to understand what are the risks and benefits in front of us? What are our options? have transparency in those communications with your provider. So that way you can really decide what's the best decision for you. So where is that disconnect? If ACOG is suggesting that people are given this choice, yet providers aren't being trained in it and or aren't trusting of it, does the disconnect break down in medical school where they're not being taught these skills? 
Well, this is a really multifactorial issue. So we can go back in history and look, you know, let's let's go in the way back machine and go back to like the early, you know, like the mid 1990s before we had this research on the increasing risks that come with multiple prior cesareans. And at the time the culture was, there was a lot of induction, um, a lot of augmentation. And that was true among people who were laboring after a cesarean. And so we saw as a result of that, um, inc that induction and augmentation, as well as some unsafe uh, nursing practices in terms of we have a lot of patients who are being monitored by a single nurse, and so they might not be able to receive the kind of close monitoring that they need. We saw some bad outcomes, and we had some lawsuits, and a lot of people came out of that saying, should we really be encouraging access to VBAC? Because at the time, we thought, well, there's this increased risk of uterine rupture, and at the time, we didn't know these increased risks that come with multiple prior cesareans, so Shouldn't we just say, okay, VBAC is really dangerous and no one do it? But one of the studies that came out that was looking at those, that those lawsuits was that 80% of those lawsuits could have been avoided if those people were laboring spontaneously and if they had closer monitoring. So, you know, we can, we can decide where we want to put our focus. Do we want to put our focus on the uterine ruptures and on the lawsuits? Or do we want to put our focus on what we can do to potentially prevent those? So that's one factor. And that was actually that whole um, time period, you can see where the VBAC rate was increasing, increasing, increasing. And that was because at the time, you know, unless there was some medical indication to say you needed a repeat cesarean, everyone had a VBAC. You know, mm -hmm. that was just the culture then. Everyone had a VBAC. Well, after we had those lawsuits, ACOG came out with new guidelines that said that um, physicians should be immediately available during someone who's laboring after a cesarean, but they didn't really provide any definition for what that meant. So hospitals started interpreting it a variety of different ways. Um, the most con what a lot of people think is that that common definition means 24-7 anesthesia. But in fact, when we look at actual hospital practice, we can see that there's a variety of different ways that hospitals define 24, uh, define that concept of immediately available. And there was a wonderful study out of California published in 2013 that found that one third of hospitals with 24 seven anesthesia don't allow feedback. Wow. I know, isn't that shocking? So you think, okay, so this is a patient safety issue, right? Because that's how it's framed for people. And these hospitals that have the highest level of staffing, they have 24 seven anesthesia, you think they would be the hospitals that would say, yes, we're gonna support VBAC, but these hospitals just opt not to. So it really isn't a safety issue. It's an issue of motivation and it's an issue of, of hospitals hearing from the public that they want this option available to them. It's an issue of following the evidence and honoring autonomy. And unfortunately that doesn't happen. So many times we see people get the risk and the bad things that can happen from VBAC, but their providers totally fail to mention the risks that are associated with another cesarean. And that'll be individual, right? Whatever that individual patient or client or pregnant person chooses is the risk that's worth it for them. The problem is if your provider is just giving you one side of the story and they are trying to present another cesarean as a very risk-free, very easy, um, kind of like you should do this, because VBAC is so risky, that's actually very biased care. And so you as the consumer, the pregnant person, you should be asking questions to your provider about the additional risk of another cesarean, about the benefits of VBAC. Um, what other questions might someone sitting in a prenatal appointment having this conversation about, should I go for a VBAC? Should I have another cesarean? Be thinking about asking their provider. Well, I think the big question, I love open-ended questions. So yeah. not, do you support VBAC, but how do you feel about VBAC? Because that's not a yes or no question. And then you sit back and you listen to them talk. You know, if they start talking about how risky and dangerous it is and how, well, yeah, but I'll let you try anyways, that's a red flag. Yeah. 
That's an absolute red flag. Um, asking questions like, well, what happens if I'm 40 weeks pregnant, if I'm 40 weeks and still pregnant? Um, do you stand, do you routinely do ultrasounds to see the, to estimate the weight of the baby, the size of the baby? Um, and these are, these are questions that are important to ask because these are some of the major roadblocks that people come up against because their provider says, oh yeah, I'm totally supportive of VBAC, but let's just get a C-section on the schedule for 39 weeks. So in the event that you don't go into labor, we already have the OR booked. And for someone who may not know that, you know, you may not necessarily go into labor spontaneously by 39 weeks. And now you have like this deadline, this, this date that's looming and staring you down in the calendar. And let me tell you, you know, stress does a whole lot of things to our bodies, but one of the things it does to the pregnant body is say, there is no way I'm giving birth. You know, anyone, whoops, sorry, phone's ringing. Um, <laughs> anyone who's ever had a pet knows that, you know, your cat in particular, they're not going to give birth in the living room in the middle of the day when you and your kids are running around, right? They're going to wait until the middle of the night and they're going to go into a closet somewhere where they feel safe and secure. And that's where they're going to birth. So high stress situations don't facilitate birth. Um, the other thing about the size of the baby, you know, a lot of providers, well, I shouldn't say a lot, some providers uh, want to check the size of the baby to get an idea. And the challenge with that is that it really messes with people's minds. You know, I mean, if you, if you've never had a vaginal delivery and your doctor's like, oh, well, you know, your baby's at eight and a half pounds and that's a really big baby. You know, if you don't know the facts, it's really easy for someone to say something like that to you. And you say, oh, well, gosh, yeah, that does sound like a really big baby. Oh, I don't want a big baby. I don't want to have a vaginal birth to a big baby. And the whole time they're planting these little seeds that are making you doubt yourself, that's inserting more fear, but it's all conveyed to you in a way that is, I'm just taking care of you. But when we look at what ACOG says, they say that going beyond 40 weeks isn't a reason to schedule a repeat cesarean okay. and expecting a big baby under, uh, is it 4,500 grams, 5,000 grams, isn't a reason to schedule a cesarean either. So, you know, this is the power of knowing the facts. And unfortunately, we can't have, we can't just blindly trust people. And sometimes people say, well, gosh, aren't you saying that like doctors are bad people? No, that's not what I'm saying. There's a lot of really great providers out there. But, you know, I think about my mechanic. I don't, I don't trust any mechanic on the street, right? Like I got the name, I found my mechanic through Yelp and he has been amazing and honest and truthful and we stay with him, but you know, not everyone is trustworthy. And we were having a little chat before we started recording about how not everyone is on the same page in terms of the quality of information they give people on the level of integrity in which they do this work. And so that's why it's important to find referrals for your physician, just like you would find referrals for a mechanic, right? So, you know, that's where, and also um, questions, go to vbacfacts.com slash questions for more questions to ask your provider. But also in terms of finding a provider, this is where talking to local doulas is really helpful. Because, you know, your, your sister might have had a great VBAC with a provider. She's like, yeah, he was awesome. But then you learn more and you're like, oh, you went into labor spontaneously at 38 weeks and six days and your baby was seven and a half pounds. And basically they had that sort of labor that easily circumvented all of these objections that you can come up against. So it's great that someone had an individual good experience with someone, but talking to doulas, talking to labor and delivery nurses who have had the opportunity to see the same provider again and again and again, that is a whole nother perspective that you just don't get from your sister-in-law's awesome VBAC, right? Or your best friend's awesome VBAC. You need to have someone who has that extended level of experience to say, okay, so I know your sister-in-law had a great VBAC with Dr. So-and-so, but I'm here to tell you that she routinely tells people, if you don't go into labor by 40 weeks, I'm going to recommend a repeat cesarean because that's safest for your baby. So that level of perspective is what people really need in order to navigate the system where almost 90% of people have a repeat cesarean 
even, even though the overwhelming majority of people are good candidates for VBAC. Wow. That is shocking. You know, one of the most powerful things that our team does hold is that we do get to see providers with multiple people, with multiple birth stories at multiple times during the year, during the week, during the hours on a 24 hour clock. Like we get to see the raw insides and outs of these hospitals and these providers. And I do think that that is a perspective that you often lose asking friends and family and and Facebook groups. Listeners, just so you know, uh, an 8.5 pound baby is a very average size pound baby. Don't let a provider tell you that an eight or nine pound baby is a huge baby. Also, the the measurements that we use are typically done by ultrasounds and they are notoriously wrong. They can be, um, they can be wrong up to a pound or two on either direction. So please, you guys don't put so, so much weight into the ultrasounds and, and quote unquote, a big baby, just so you know, too, your provider believing that your baby is quote unquote big is a huge risk factor in and of itself. So Jen, now that we've made our way to induction, let's talk about induction with a VBAC and it may change for someone who's had two or three previous cesareans. So I guess right now let's tackle just after one cesarean. What's the data say? So, you know, there is a lot of, there's a lot of back and forth on this topic. And so I'm really glad you brought it up because some people say, you know, the risk of uterine rupture increases with induction. And so we should not be inducing people who are pregnant after a cesarean. Okay. Okay. So let's take that perspective. So what happens if someone develops preeclampsia and they are faced with either a repeat cesarean or remaining pregnant with preeclampsia? What about having an option of saying, well, you know, you can have that repeat cesarean if you want, but we do have some time. And so if you want to try an induction and potentially avoid a repeat cesarean, that's an option for you. So It's all about understanding what our options are and having all the options on the table. And so when we say induction is bad, what we're really saying is if someone encounters or experiences some sort of complication where the pregnancy needs to conclude, their only option is a repeat cesarean. And so, you know, we, I and VBAC Facts believes that people have the ability to make their own medical decisions and in consultation with your provider on your individual situation in terms of the risks and benefits to be able to say, okay, well, this is your situation right now. Say you have preeclampsia and here are the risks and benefits of doing, of inducing and just seeing where that goes. And here are the risks and benefits of having a repeat cesarean. So, you know, it's really important not to demonize options because there's always a time when an option is absolutely appropriate and reasonable. And, you know, I think about all the back and forth about epidurals, you know, the best time to get an epidural is when you want an epidural. That's the best time to get one. You know, there is a big difference between saying, I'm going to have an unmedicated birth and I am suffering right now. And I have been, I haven't slept in 36 hours and I am exhausted and I am suffering. Like, so, you know, and also, I just want to say this in terms of, I'm kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent, so forgive That's me, but totally someone on fine. Instagram um, recently shared their birth story with me, and I asked her if I can share it um, on Instagram, but I can just, you know, she had really wanted to have an unmedicated vaginal delivery, and she was so exhausted by the time she got to pushing, and her baby was right there, and her doctor said, hey, I can use the vacuum and we could just have this baby out in one little suck. You know, you're super tired. It's okay. And she was like, yes, please. And they used the vacuum. The baby was out. She was immediately like, thank God that's over. But she said how she felt a lot of shame afterwards and how she wouldn't judge anyone else who was in that same situation. But for herself, she felt shame that she couldn't do it on her own. And it really touched this part in my heart that you know, I'm a type A person. I love to plan things out, but there is, there is this level that you just cannot plan for in birth. Like there's so many, so many choices you can make. You can pick the best provider and, you know, you can eat the best food and you can have the best mindset and you can have all this stuff. And yet there's this other little element that we just can't control. And being able to just say, okay, well, these are all the things I can control. If you are a recovering perfectionist like myself, 
And then you can say, there's this element that I just can't control. And just leaning into that and taking it moment by moment and being kind with ourselves when we bump up against an element that we can't control and we have to make a decision that maybe we didn't think we would have to make, like about either having a, you know, a vacuum or a C-section or whatever, it has, it's not a judgment on you or your body or your ability to birth. It's just what happened in the moment. And I think, you know, especially having children and how us female types are often very hard on ourselves. And in that moment, I offer to you to think, what would you tell your child if they were in that situation? And then talk to yourself that same way. Give yourself that same love, that same empathy, that same patience of just, you know, this was something outside of your control and you did the best that you could. And it's okay to feel sad about it, but feeling sad and feeling shame, that's a, that's a little bit of a different element. You know, nature controls a lot of birth, you guys. We, we talk about this in this community all the time. You can control a lot in labor. And a lot of those things you have 100% control over. But the things that you don't have control over, you pretty much have zero control over. You have zero <laughs> control over whether you get gestational diabetes. You have zero control over whether you get cholestasis or preeclampsia or pups. Um, there's so many things that are completely out of our control because nature plays a huge role in birth. So along the same lines of induction, right before we kind of transition to uh, two or three previous cesareans, is there anything special that we need to know about inducing with VBAC medications we want to stay away mm. from, medications that are always used, things that we just need to know if we get into the place where we either choose or need an induction with a VBAC? Well, ACOG says, again, the American College of OBGYNs, that Pitocin or a Foley catheter are the ideal ways to induce a VBAC okay. and to avoid things like Cytotec that are associated with an elevated risk of uterine rupture. So um, it's, what's interesting is that in looking into the research, and I'm going to be circling back into this within professional membership and looking at the action, looking at the totality of evidence on labor after cesarean induction, one of the things that I've come across is a study of oral induction with Cytotec from Europe. And so, you know, it's interesting to look at how different countries do things because it gives us a wide of perspective and maybe an idea of, oh, well, if we use this type of medication with this dosage at this interval, maybe we could have better outcomes than, you know, so this is why I think it's really important to not just look at, you know, what's happening in your community or in your hospital or at your doctor's practice, but to open up our worldview and say, well, what's happening across the state? What's happening in our country versus other countries to just really compare and contrast and get an idea of, you know, the way that we do things may not always be the best way. There might be a way that someone else is doing it that we can say, oh, wow, you're having really good outcomes with X, Y, and Z. Why don't we learn more about how you're doing that? And so that way we can all be elevating each other rather than being in this place, well, this is how we do things and this is how we're gonna continue to do things. And you know, we're essentially don't care how other people do things. I'm a lifelong learner. I always wanna be learning like, What's the new stuff? What, how are other people doing things? So that way we can elevate the practice of care rather than stagnation. Absolutely. One of the things that we do in the birth lounge consistently is looking at what are other countries doing and in quite a pessimistic style. I would say there's a lot of countries that we should probably be learning from and that we should uh, be mimicking or copying what they are doing uh, because the U.S., we just don't rank very well for a country of our size and stature and economics and resources when it comes to birth. Um, and VBAC definitely is one of the things that pulls our stats down because we're just not a VBAC friendly country. And when we look at other countries, they're so much more friendly and open and VBAC is just treated as a normal variation of labor. So when it comes to having a vaginal birth after two cesareans, what have you found? Well, I think the first thing people need to hear is that VBAC after two cesareans is also a mainstream 
evidence-based, reasonable option supported by national guidelines and medical studies. Yes. So that is like the main takeaway that people need to hear. So, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, what do the national guidelines say? Because I thought, I hear this all the time. ACOG says, you know, they don't support VBAC. ACOG says VBAC is dangerous. ACOG says you have to do this or you have to do that. Well, I like to actually go to what ACOG says and see what they say, because I found that often what ACOG recommends is um, misinterpreted or maybe misunderstood by people and they don't really understand what ACOG says. And so they've been quite clear for many years that it is reasonable to consider women with two previous low transverse cesarean deliveries to be candidates for trial of labor after cesarean and to counsel them based on a combination of other factors that affect their ability or probability of achieving a successful VBAC. So ACOG supports VBAC after two cesareans. And one of the reasons why they do this is because the evidence supports it. And the other reason is, is because we know those risks increase after to uh, after, uh, well, they increase with every cesarean when we're just looking strictly at those risks associated with those multiple prior cesareans. So when people are considering how many children they want to have, that's something to keep in mind. You know, if you want to have four kids and you've had two prior cesareans, you might say, you know what? So instead of taking on the risks of previous cesareans, people can say, okay, I'm going to plan a VBAC after two cesareans and take on that elevated risk of uterine rupture, but then I won't have those increased risks that are associated with multiple prior cesareans. So this is where a conversation with your provider on, well, how many kids do you plan to have um, and that you want to have? And you know, sometimes the stork delivers and you're not expecting it. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that you might say, okay, well, I just wanna have this second child and I'm done. And so some people say, I just wanna have that repeat cesarean because I'm not having more kids. And then they get pregnant again. And they're like, oh, well, now I've got two prior cesareans. So what do I wanna do now? So that's an important consideration to keep in mind. How many more children do you want to have? Sure. That's um, a question that I think a lot of people don't even really think about because for so many people, I don't think VBAC is an option that they really consider. So many yeah. people just assume that once a cesarean, always a cesarean. And I don't know where that phrase came from, but it's totally just not true. You can be once a cesarean, always a cesarean if you want to and you choose that. But I love how you point out it's all about the risk and what are you willing to take on? VBAC has risk. Cesarean has risk. First time vaginal deliveries have risk. You guys, nothing in life comes without risk. It just simply comes down to what risk are you willing to take? So are there increased risk with VBAC after two cesareans that are different than just a regular VBAC after one cesarean that we need to maybe extra consideration for? Well, the overall risk of uterine rupture after two cesareans is still low. Okay. And when we look at the available studies, the two largest studies on the topic report ranges, uh, report uterine rupture rates ranging from 0.9%, which is about one in 111 to 1.8%, which is about one in 50. So when we look at that, we think, okay, so that is a higher than after one cesarean. But when the other thing to consider when we're looking at these statistics is how many people in those studies were induced or augmented because induction and augmentation has been associated with higher rates of uterine rupture. So when we dig a little bit deeper into those studies, let me actually pull it up here in front of me. How many, yeah, the actual range. So 49 to 65% of people in those two studies were induced or augmented. Wow, that's not even an honest real look then. Exactly. So this is the challenge. You know, these are the numbers that are thrown around. And when you look at ACOG's guidelines, these are the numbers they talk about. And yet I wanted, you know, in the course of writing this article and creating this continuing education training for professionals, I actually read all of the studies on this topic. And that is when you uncover little delicious nuggets like this 49 to 65% induction and augmentation rate. Okay, so that absolutely can impact the rate of reported uterine rupture. 
So when we ask, you know, what is the risk of spontaneous uterine rupture? So you are laboring spontaneously after two prior cesareans. What's the risk of uterine rupture? We don't have the data on that. Now we do have the data on that after one cesarean because we have a lot more studies on after one since after one cesarean than after two. But after two, we really don't have that data. It certainly, I, I can say with pretty um, good confidence that I think it would be significantly lower than 0.9 to 1.8%. But how much lower? No one can really say. And so that is the power of actually understanding what these studies say, rather than just looking at the abstract and looking at the summary, because the summary doesn't include information like that, that is relevant to the findings that they reported. And also finding a doctor that believes in VBAC and is not going to induce you for bogus reasons and is going to let you go into spontaneous labor and is going to support ambulatory or mobile movement in labor, not going to put you on that 24 hour clock, not going to make you labor in the OR where you have that visual and mental and emotional stress. You guys, there are providers out there who are truly supportive of VBAC. And then there are providers who say they're supportive of VBAC, but then when you actually listen to their words or you see their actions, they're they're really just not. Jen, this conversation has absolutely blown my mind. What else in these last few minutes do people need to know about either VBAC or VBAC after two cesareans? Well, you can learn more about VBAC after two cesareans at vbacfacts.com slash VBA2C. So um, I just want to also share really quick that the other maternal and neonatal risks associated with vaginal birth after two cesareans was also low. And in fact, one study described maternal complications during planned vaginal birth after two cesareans as small. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of context and nuance that we need when we're looking at the available options and to understand what the research says and help that guide us through our options. So people can go there to learn more. And if you are a perinatal professional who wants to dive deeper and take our training on this topic, as well as the library of trainings that we have on a variety of topics about VBAC, go to vbacfacts.com slash membership to learn more. And where can people connect with you to follow you on Instagram or if they were interested in learning um, just more general VBAC facts from you? There are a number of VBAC platforms out there, but I want to make sure that we're pointing people to a place of integrity and someone like you who's truly going through all the research. There's a lot of misinformation out there uh, surrounding VBAC and it can actually be very dangerous, you guys. So make sure that you're truly following platforms um, um, and, and organizations that are doing their due diligence to make sure that you have uh, the highest quality, latest up to date, like honest and transparent information. So Jen, other than the links that you've given us, where can people connect with online? So we are VBAC Facts with no space, all one word on, all, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, that's where you can find us. So just go there, look that up and you'll connect with us. And we have a ton of information up on the website. Um, we have a VBAC training, a VBAC checklist for people who are planning VBACs available for download at vbacfacts.com slash checklist. We have a free report talking about the top five myths associated with uterine rupture. People can download that at vbacfacts.com slash report. And one of the things that I'm really a stickler about, and we just posted about this yesterday on social media, is how important it is to cite your sources. Yeah. You know, some people are under the impression that there's not a whole lot of VBAC research out there. And so therefore we really don't know what the answers are. And I think it's important for people to know that there are thousands of studies out there on VBAC, thousands of studies. And so on some, to some topics like vaginal birth after one cesarean, we have a uterine rupture, we've got some pretty solid data on that. But other topics, we don't have good data like vaginal birth after three or more cesareans. So one of the things that when you're looking at anything that someone's written about VBAC is you wanna understand where did they get their data are they talking about the strength of the evidence available? 
because just because a study has been published doesn't mean that study is a good study, doesn't mean it's a strong study. Um, we need to qualify how that study was done in order to make sure that it was performed in a way that is applicable to the larger population. And then we also need to talk about the individual studies that were conducted. So not only the strength of the evidence, but then looking specifically at the various studies and saying, okay, so this is a study that's a really good study. This is a study that's not. That's the kind of nuance. And when you say due diligence, that really needs to be done because you can go out and you can find a study that can prove anything, right? People say this all the time, but when you actually qualify those studies and you say, oh, well, this isn't a really good study because say they induce a significant portion of their population. Well, their findings are not going to necessarily be applicable to someone who is laboring spontaneously. So it's just one example of the things we need to consider. Also things like how many people were included in the study. If you, there was a study that came out a few years ago on vaginal birth after three cesareans, it included 80 people. So, you know, on one hand I say, okay, it's great that there's being studies conducted and it's wonderful that this topic is getting more attention and hopefully we'll get more studies that are um, inspired by this one and we can get more information, but we can't look at a study of 80 people and say, okay, so because there were zero uterine ruptures, that means uterine rupture doesn't happen. Or maybe there were five uterine ruptures. Oh my gosh, that means the uterine rupture happens all the time. We can't do that. So that's just a couple things to look for. Um, we actually just posted, when was that? A couple days ago about how to evaluate medical research. We have an article on the website about that, looking specifically at VBAC studies and talking about things like um, how many people they include, how many people they induce, and other questions that you should be asking when you're looking at VBAC research, because they're not all the same. And just because a study was published somewhere doesn't mean that is the end all be all on that topic. It's you got to look at all the studies on that topic and look at all their findings together. And that's how you can parse your way towards closer to what the truth really is. That is Yes, you just hit the nail on the head. One of the things that popped into my head when you were saying that is the ARRIVE trial. Like yes. that, that study, ugh, it makes me so angry because it changed the way that obstetrics was done. And it is such a poorly it's not a poorly done study, but it has so many limitations that it is not applicable to the general public, yet that's how the OBGYN community kind of took it and ran with it. And so being able to uh, kind of decipher what's good information, what is not good information, what are good studies, but they have major limitations, all of this plays a role in you guys making your decision for whatever is best for you. Jen, this conversation has been amazing. Oh yeah, what else do you want to say? Please? Well, I just want to say one thing. Okay, talking about how studies are conducted in the ARRIVE trial. I don't know if a lot of people know that the people included in the ARRIVE trial agreed to, be, to have their labors randomly either induced or not. So when we talk about uh, the study findings and those people in that study, are they really representative of the larger population? Hee hee, would you say, yes, have whether my labor is induced or not set to a flip of a coin of a computer randomization? Isn't no. Crazy? Isn't yeah. Cool? I mean, yeah, it is. It's, it's wild. So this is like one of those nuanced things that we need to look at. Um, the other thing is, you know, the rate of cesarean among those who were induced was 19%. Wow. The rate of cesarean among those who had expected management, it was like 21, 22%. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a 3% difference, a 3% difference. So, and my, and my response to that is, you know, if we are really concerned about reducing cesarean rates, there's other ways that we can do it that have nothing to do with induction. Say, following the midwifery model of care. I mean, that would be a wonderful way to reduce cesarean rates without inducing everyone. But that is not the question the study asked. Mm -hmm. Also, the other thing to consider is that when they looked at all the other maternal and neonatal outcomes, there were no improvements. Nope. So, you know, we need to look at what were the questions that they asked what were the significant findings and what were all the questions that they asked that weren't significant? It wasn't like they had all these really great outcomes. The only difference was this very modest 
um, decrease in the cesarean rate. But when you look at other studies who are citing the ARRIVE trial, all they talk about is this significant difference, this reduction in cesarean rates, without talking about, well, what was the absolute reduction? 3%. That's quite modest. Yeah, negligible at best. And I, every time I say like, that's a negligible amount, uh, there's always someone that comes back and is like, 3% is not negligible. Sure, that is your personal opinion. I would say that the majority of pregnant people would not take on the incredible risk of induction in a possible unnecessary C-section for a 3% decrease in a C-section. Anywho, all right, we are out of time, Jen, but this has been absolutely lovely. You have given us so much information and I know that people are walking away feeling very inspired and hopefully empowered. You guys go out, do your own research, hook up with VBAC facts, go ahead and ask those questions to your doctor. Don't be afraid to change providers if your provider is not VBAC supportive. Remember the difference between VBAC friendly and truly being VBAC supportive. Know what the data says yourself so that when you are presented with misinformation, or fear-based care, you are armed to protect yourself and switch gears. All right, you guys, we will see you next week on another episode of the Birth Lounge Podcast. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time on the Birth Lounge Podcast. Until then, head over to Instagram and find us at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow. You can also check us out at thebirthlounge.com.